Well, good morning. Uh, we are so fortunate, by we I mean Kathy and me, uh, that we had the privilege of being in Israel. And the only thing better than that is the privilege of being back here with you uh, to hear your hundreds of voices singing about the greatness of our God and to see your faces and to know some of the stories. And every person here has a story. But today I'm just so thankful. Joe and Heather Richards are over here. Would you mind just giving a wave? Uh, Joe just had brain surgery for cancer on Thursday, and he's here today. And we're praying for him. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, they, they have followed Christ through some really tough trials, and this newest trial is his battle with cancer. We think the surgery went well, and we're just praying that God will heal him. Uh, I think it was David who said, God, I want to praise you in the land of the living, meaning I believe in heaven, I'm going to praise you there, but I'd like a few more years here. And so we're praying that for Joe and Heather and many others. Oh, it's so good to be with you this morning. This is Palm Sunday. We begin what some traditions call Holy Week. Starts with today, Palm Sunday, moves to Friday, Good Friday, crescendos with the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. And as we come to this week, the secular world even turns its attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may have noticed that CNN is running a series right now titled Finding Jesus, Faith, Fact, and Forgery. They're not suggesting that Jesus was a forgery, but their primary storyline is following some of the relics, particularly the Shroud of Turin, the ossuary box of James, pieces of what some say is the true cross of Christ. And CNN's doing a wonderful job of giving us what, what is found archaeologically and what has not been found archaeologically, where the Bible's been supported, where we still need to find evidence. And then I believe it will be, is it tonight or next Sunday night that Bill O'Reilly's Killing Jesus will be aired? Tonight? What was that, Jeff? Eight o'clock tonight, and I think it's the National Geographic Channel. And if you're not familiar with that book, Killing Jesus is outstanding. I, I came to it a little bit skeptical, and I'm just being a little too blunt today. I guess when you're gone for two weeks, part of your brain goes to sleep and it's not all awake, so I'm just going to do say things I normally wouldn't. I'm, and you can write me and I'll understand, I'm not a Bill O'Reilly news commentator fan. I, I, it's just a little bit too much yelling and screaming for me. Um, I got an amen on that one. So when, when I see a book on Jesus by Bill O'Reilly, I'm going, really? I, but I, I got the book, and he, he wrote it, but he cites in big letters with Martin Dugard. And Martin Dugard is a first-class historian. His credentials are impeccable. And so the history's coming from Martin Dugard, and I learned through this book that Bill O'Reilly is a fabulous writer and storyteller. And it is an excellent book that's going to be produced into this movie tonight. And I bring these two things up, not so much to do commercials for them, but to say the whole culture is asking questions. Is Jesus real? How do we know he's real? What can we verify? What do we have doubts about? What evidence is there for Easter. So today, Friday, and next weekend, we're going to be talking about the subject of evidence. And today we believe that Jesus is God because he provided miracles to show us his divine power and his divine nature. We're going to look at a number of questions, but the three overriding questions are these. Number one, are miracles possible? Now, this is a friendly question. We're not trying to say we are Christians, we believe the Bible, we believe in miracles, and those people who don't believe in miracles, we're not going to get into a shouting match. You'll never win somebody to your cause by shouting at them. You'll never win somebody to your cause by belittling or berating them. So as we ask the question, are miracles possible, most of all, we want this to be a friendly question. Now, we're in the height of 
Homestead winning a state championship and the, the final four is going to be settled today and we're going to go into the national championships and you know how fans can be over the top. We've got spirit, how about you? And then the other side shouts back all the harder. Too often our political debates and our religious beliefs are communicated as though we think we have to outshout each other. And today what we want to show is that there are reasons to believe. There's evidence to trust that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Savior of the world, but that he's your Savior and he's mine. Science must follow the law of uniformity. Now, what do we mean by that? Science says that the natural systems that are in effect today have always been in effect today, and science can only work if there is the law of uniformity. Let me explain the law of uniformity. The law of uniformity says that every year there are the same number of days. This year, 2015, there'll be 365 and one-fourth days. Was that way last year? That way the next year. Next year, because we don't have a way of adjusting for that fourth day, we'll call it what? Leap year. Now, that's just our way of adjusting because we know that the earth revolves around the sun with consistency or uniformity. It was that way this year, last year. In fact, it was that way every year I can remember. And it was that way a thousand years ago, and it was that way two thousand years ago. That's the law of uniformity. And science says the only way we can do scientific observations is if we believe in a uniform world and universe. So things fall at a constant rate. Airplanes would not be able to fly if some days the force of gravity was greater than the other days. Airplanes would not be able to stay in the air if there was more gravitational pull at some particular date on the calendar. Uniformity demands consistency. So there would be those who would say there cannot be a miracle because a miracle would say there was a non-uniform moment in time. But this is really not a scientific question. It is a philosophical question. And let me illustrate. For centuries, the scientific world believed that the universe was eternal. It always existed. When you ask the question, where did matter come from? Matter has always been here. Where did energy come from? Energy has always been there. And science loved the belief that the universe was eternal because that said there was no God, there was no creator, there was no force to be explained outside of nature. But in the last century, all of that came crumbling down. And everybody in the scientific world believes that the universe had a point of beginning. That is called, in scientific terms, a point of singularity. Now let me try to explain this. What scientists have observed is through astrophysics that the universe is expanding, it's moving out, it's getting less dense, it's spreading itself. And the more the time goes on, the more the universe expands. So you don't have to be a scientist to say if in time moving forward the universe expanded, if you could turn back time, that's a cool song, isn't it? If I could turn back time. If you could turn back time, you would see the universe doing what? Contracting, shrinking. And eventually it shrinks back to the point of its maximum density, and there was a point in time when, boom, the Big Bang occurred and started this expansion of the universe. So science says there was a point when the world began. And neither science nor religion can say we know what there was before that point of singularity. Stephen Hawking says, well, maybe there was another universe that gave rise to our universe, which only says what was the nature of that universe and how did it come into existence? And we're back to the exact same argument. So it's a philosophical question. One side of the philosophical debate is called naturalism. Naturalism says the world 
and the universe is a closed system. All there is is nature. Uh, Mr. Cosmos, Carl Sagan was famous for saying, the cosmos is all there is, all there was, or all there ever will be. It is a closed system. The other worldview is called supernaturalism. And by that, we're not saying we're super, we're superior to naturalism. It simply says there's something above nature, beyond nature, outside of nature, that influences nature. We would say more than influences. We would say it creates and it causes nature. But there's something outside of nature, namely God. And God can do something non-uniform in this world. So the question, are miracles possible, is not a scientific question. It's a philosophical one. Do we believe that there's something beyond and before the Big Bang? Second question is this. Even if we believe that there is supernaturalism, that God can do something miraculous, that doesn't mean that Jesus did. How do we know that Jesus did something supernatural? Well, I tried something on the last service, and it worked pretty well, so I'm going to do it with you. We did this about 15 years ago, but most of us can't remember 15 minutes ago, so I think we're safe. You can do this in your head, but you might want to use a piece of paper. I want you to pick a number between 1 and 9. So make, make a number between 1 and 9. Multiply your number by 9. You now have a two-digit two-digit number. Your number is either 09 or 18 or some other number. You with me? So take your two-digit number, add those two digits together. So you have a new number. Okay. Now subtract 5 from your new number. And we're done with all the math. So if you're going, oh, how long is this going to go? So now you have your final number. We're going to convert your number into a letter. So if your number is 1, A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, D is 4, E is 5, F is 6. Keep going as far as you need to till, till you've got a letter. Okay, now the, I'm going to ask you three questions, and you have to think of these instantly. You can't say, well, let me get my cell phone out here for a minute. Okay, so you've got a letter. I want you to identify a country that begins with your letter. Okay, you have to have that by now. Go to the spelling of your country, its last letter, pick up that last letter, and think of an animal that begins with that last letter. Now go to the last letter of your animal and think of a color. Got it? Why are you thinking of an orange kangaroo in Denmark? <laughs> you want to know how I did that? I have supernatural powers. <laughs> Now, it, it's really a simple explanation. How many would like to know the explanation? Come back next week. No, it, it's, it's really simple. Whatever number you pick, any number, single-digit number, multiplied by 9, the sum of those two digits will always be 9. So everybody ended up with 9. Everybody subtracted 5. Everybody ended up with a new number, 4, except for a few of you who the math was a little too tough. But, <laughs> but we don't have to raise any hands. And so everybody had four, everybody had D. Nobody probably thought of the Dominican Republic. We all went to Denmark. So, so now why, why waste precious time on Sunday morning with this? Because there will be the accusation that Jesus was a con man. Jesus knew how to appear to know things that were mysterious and magical. Jesus appeared to be able to work miracles, but he was really just a, an overachieving Egyptian magician. That's how he did all this. So how do we know that Jesus really performed miracles? So we're going to tackle some things real quickly. First, what difference does it make if Jesus actually performed miracles? I mean, if he did or if he didn't, why is this such a big deal? And the answer is because Jesus did miracles to support his claim to be God. Now here's the very first miracle Jesus did. Let, let's test how our 
teaching department, our Sunday school classes did over the years. What's the first miracle that Jesus performed? Now, why does everybody know that one? Does that make you suspicious? Everybody knows that one. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't been here for two weeks, so I'm just gushing forth. So I, I've got another story for you. Th this guy's driving rather, rather erratically, and the police officer pulls him over and notices that the man is a clergyman because he's got this collar thing on. And so the police officer is being very polite, and he says, uh, Father, um, have you been drinking anything? And he holds up this bottle of water and says, just this water. Police officer says, mind if I take a look at that water? Minister hands it out, police officer open, takes a whiff and it knocks his nostrils for a loop. And he says, well, Father, this is not water in here. There's something a lot stronger than water here. And the clergyman looked at him and said, he did it again. <laughs> well, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. Here's a statement in John chapter 2, verse 11. This was the first of his miraculous signs. So this is Jesus' first miracle that Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. Now here's the important phrase. He thus revealed his glory. This was in a fraternity party. Hey, y'all watch this. You're not going to believe what I can do. He was revealing his glory. And it worked. Notice the next phrase. And his disciples put their faith in him. So the reason why Jesus did miracles was so that people would see his glory, see that he was God, and then put their faith in him. Now, on the night that Jesus was arrested, the eve of his crucifixion, he tells his disciples that he is going to go to back to the Father. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father. Now, here's John 14, 11. Jesus said, believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So in your notes, underline that phrase, believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. When asked, why should we believe in you? The answer Jesus gave is believe the miracles that I have done. A second question Weren't Jesus' miracles just psychosomatic healings? Now, by psychosomatic, we mean mind over body. Psyche means your mind, soma, your body. And there are times when today we experienced psychosomatic healings. And, and let me give you an illustration. The placebo effect is a psychosomatic healing. Let me give you an illustration. Everybody in the room has a common disease. I don't know what it is, but it's a common disease. And, and this group right here is going to get the best medicine we have available. You like that, Kathy. This group here is going to get a placebo, a sugar pill that has no therapeutic value at all. And this group is going to get nothing. You're the control group. And what we want to see is how do these people improve compared to the control group? And then we want to see how these people improve compared to the control group and the group that had the real medicine. We want to see how much healing is taking place that wasn't even attributable to the medicine, that it's just psychosomatic. Now, in fact, there's a new study that just came out uh, this month that treating Parkinson's patients... They gave these people the real medicine. They gave these people a placebo, but told them it's the real medicine, and it's the really good, it's the expensive stuff. And these people were told they were getting real medicine. It was a placebo, but they were told, you got the generic brand. We don't know how it's going to work. And these people got nothing. At least we're consistent. What happened was these people improved far more than these people. In other words, Believing the medicine is powerful, brings about some healing, but believing the medicine is not only powerful, but expensive, they even got better. If it doesn't prove anything scientifically, it at least proves they're Americans that think that the more you spend, the more you have. So there is scientific evidence for psychosomatic healing. Is that what Jesus did? 
Did he find some people who had problems and he could give them hope and elevate their expectations, stimulate their endocrine system, and they, they healed themselves? Well, some people, no doubt, could have been healed that way, but not hardly all of the cases. For example, there are accounts of congenital healing. For example, in John 9, there says, a man was born blind. This was something structurally wrong with his ability to see. This wasn't shock, trauma. This was a congenital condition. Jesus healed him. There are accounts of what I call complex healings. For example, in John chapter 5, there is a man sitting by the pool of Bethesda who has not walked for 38 years. Jesus says to him, I'm healing you. Rise, walk, take your mat, and move on. And the man walks. There's at least three miracles there. That's what I mean by complexity. First of all, there's the orthopedic healing. What, what leg was broken? What bones were crushed? What disease like arthritis had made it impossible for him to walk? There was an orthopedic problem. Jesus healed that. But healing the orthopedic problem would not allow this man to walk because he hasn't walked for 38 years. His muscles would have come, succumb to the most severe level of atrophy. If it would be possible to rehabilitate this man's muscles, it would take months, if not years. So Jesus not only healed the orthopedic problem, he healed the muscular problem. And then even if the man's muscles were able to support him, he would have to redevelop the motor skills to walk. We see this all the time. Somebody goes into the hospital, they end up in the hospital for a long time, and their muscles atrophy, and they lose their motor skills. We got a young man from our church, an outstanding athlete, played high school basketball this year, got a severe case of mononucleosis, and was benched, not from the team, but from school, from sports, from life, for a month. And once the doctor said, okay, your disease is under control, he didn't have the strength to walk out onto the basketball court. Once he got his strength up that he could walk out on the basketball court, he shot the ball, and this is a great shooter who couldn't find the rim because his motor skills had to be re-stimulated and redeveloped. So for this man to rise up and walk, there's nothing psychosomatic about it. There was an orthopedic healing, there was a muscular healing, and there was a rehabilitation healing. Other examples are miracles over nature, when Jesus walked on water, or he fed the 5,000, or he calmed the storm. Third question that is often posed, aren't the miracles of Jesus simply legends? I mean, let's face it. When we catch the fish, he's this big. When we tell our son about it, he's this big. When we tell our grandson about it, he's this big. Stories get better with the telling. Is that what happened? Did Jesus do a few things like pick a number between one and nine and convince people that he had wisdom and knowledge and power? And legends just sprang up. Well, first of all, there are early accounts of the miracles of Jesus. What we mean by early accounts is that Jesus performed miracles and these were reported immediately. These were spread throughout the country. These were known in other places. Secondly, there were too many disinterested parties living at the time. And what we mean by disinterested parties is you've got the disciples who are being accused of fabricating stories, turning legends into giant feats that weren't realistic. And then you have the enemies of Jesus who aren't going to believe anything no matter what proof there is. But in the middle you have what we call disinterested parties. And Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians 15 that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who saw these things and were still alive. Meaning the stories sprang up so close to the events that they could not be legends because there would be too many people to refute them. There are also hostile accounts of miracles by Jesus. 
And what we mean by that is the people who hated Jesus, the people who orchestrated his death, report that he did miracles. Their problem was they didn't want to believe that he had power from God. So when they saw the miracles, they say, we know where you got your power. You got your power from Satan. It's by the prince of demons that you cast out demons. So his enemies couldn't deny the miracles as mere legends. A fourth question, aren't these stories just the, the stories that would be predictable propaganda of his friends? In other words, Peter and James and John and Matthew and Mark and Luke, these are all Jesus' buddies. They're going to tell the stories to make Jesus look good. Well, as it turns out, they did a lousy job. There are unexpected accounts. If you want to fabricate a story about Jesus, you would not include Jesus healing people who are the enemies of the people he's trying to impress. And Jesus is a Jewish man trying to convince the Jewish leadership that he is their Messiah. And these guys, Mark, John, Matthew, they're writing stories that Jesus healed a Roman centurion's daughter. We don't help the Romans. They're the enemy. You would not create this story if you were trying to impress people. Uh, there was an arch enemy to the north called Syria. Not much has changed. There was a woman from Syria living in Phoenicia, and Jesus healed her daughter. Those are two historic enemies. We're not saying Jesus should not have healed him. We're saying the disciples should not include these stories if they're simply fabrications to make Jesus look good. You would tell the story of Jesus healing a Pharisee's daughter, not a Roman's daughter. Most notably, Jesus healed in ways that brought criticism to his cause. The most obvious of these is Jesus healed people on the Sabbath and the religious conservatives weren't concerned at all that he could do miracles. They were saying, you shouldn't be doing this. This is work on the Sabbath. We go, that's really weird. Nobody would think like that. Oh, yes. Many people think like this today. We just came back from Israel and we were there on Shabbat, which means Sabbath. And on Sabbath, they reprogram an elevator for a Shabbat elevator. Our room happened to be on the 12th floor. If you got on the regular elevator, you could push 12, and you could probably go from 1 to 12 in about 30 seconds. But if you got on the Shabbat elevator, it was pre-programmed to stop on every floor because they considered it work to push a button. So a good, Hasidic, conservative, traditional Jew would take the Shabbat elevator. They didn't have to push a button. It would stop on every floor which was exceedingly painful if you weren't Jewish and you got on the wrong elevator and it's stopping for nobody. Now that story is not to belittle their tradition, it's to say to this very day, Jewish people of some different denominations are that conservative as they were in Jesus' day. And if you're gonna make Jesus look good, you have him healing somebody on a Tuesday, a Thursday, but not on a Sabbath day. Jesus healed people who were least able to heal him, to help him. He healed social outcasts. He healed leopards. He healed the poor. A fifth question that presents itself, didn't the disciples create these stories to gain recognition and fame? I mean, isn't it fun to be able to say, oh, you went to Washington, D.C., and you met the president of the United States? I mean, there, there's some stories to be told about that one. Isn't that why the disciples are telling these stories? So not only does Jesus look good, but they look really good. They're part of the chosen 12. Well, if that's the case, they are the largest group of slow learners in history. Because every time they spoke positively of Jesus, they were arrested, they were imprisoned, they were beaten, and they were told never to speak the name of Jesus again. I want you to know that any sane person who was making stories up for public approval and got public beatings, they would look for a new strategy. 
But these men stuck to their story for all of their life. Sixth and final question, isn't using the Bible to support Jesus a case of circular reasoning? And the answer is yes. I mean, we say we believe Jesus is God because he did miracles, and we know that Jesus did miracles because the Bible tells us. Well, we're just using inside information to support it, which is very valid if the Bible's true, and we believe it is. But a non-believer might say, is there any evidence outside of the Bible? And there is. Not much, but there's some. But when I say not much, do not be discouraged. There's not much information on many people from the first century. In fact, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, uh, was suspicious to many people until they found an artifact with his name on it in the late 1960s. Theretofore, many people said Pilate was just a construction of Christians so that they had a good villain to go with their story. So there is a paucity of evidence for Pilate, the governor. We shouldn't expect there to be an abundance of evidence for Jesus, and it turns out there is rather sufficient evidence for Jesus. Two sources, one by the name of Josephus, the other by the name of Celsus, both give testimony that Jesus did miracles. Now, Josephus just says it and moves on. Celsus says that Jesus did it by magic, by trickery, by deception. But either way, the historical record says that Jesus did miracles. So that brings us to our final question. Are miracles possible? The answer is, if there's a God, then miracles are possible. Did Jesus do miracles? Hopefully we've convinced you that he did, and any objections to the miracles aren't strong arguments. And then the most important question is this. The question, what do you believe? Jesus did these miracles, he said, as evidence for you to believe. Let's pray together. If God's Spirit in recent days perhaps at this time, is speaking to you. And from the inside out, you sense your need for God to take over your life. I invite you to silently pray with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God, that you not only did miracles, but you died for my sins. I ask you to forgive me and to take over my life. Amen.